<laughs> well, what Ed and I would like to do today is to welcome you to the real world. So we had uh, a really uh, a good opportunity to be on the ground on a very intense uh, reform program in the Philippines. And so we start off with Ed um, telling you the story about how you mobilize different stakeholders to first understand the problem and then to figure out what they're going to do and then to agree to work together. And in the afternoon, after that whole phase, and he'll tell you a big story and get you all involved and excited about the issues, the challenges that confront you in the real world, we'll talk about what happens after the law is passed and then we'll talk about implementation. And then we'll have some exercises to give you some practice on uh, how might you apply some of the tools like framing. How do you frame an issue so that it will resonate with particular stakeholder groups. So today, welcome to the real world, which is your world. And uh, we, <laughs> we hope we'll have an engaging, lively discussion. And please feel free to ask. Ed was on the ground. He was living this day to day. So. Uh, welcome. Thanks, Gabby. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Want to go do some dances? <laughs> Get you all part up? <laughs> Way too early. Maybe tonight, not Tonight, tonight, okay. okay. Uh, Oscar, a good friend from Brazil, to, you know, yeah, teach us a new song about it. <laughs> okay. It's yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Um, actually, it's a pleasure for me to share this uh, with you. Um, uh, back in, uh, this was in 1998, uh, I was invited by the government of the Philippines then to come and uh, help them with their budget reforms. Uh, back then, you know, my, my work really focused for, the, for, for quite a few years on what is now known as public financial management, so I was some sort of a emerging guru in the bank in this area, so a new president came in and said, you know, we want to kind of, you know, uh, reform a budget system. And so I said, fine, that'd be great, you know, so I, I came. Uh, thinking that, okay, it's about, you know, um, creating a medium-term expenditure framework and you know, all the standard stuff that what we do in the World Bank. You know? But I did get a surprise in my life because uh, uh, within about a week or two that I actually joined the, the department, this is the Department of Budget and Management, you know, uh, uh, the secretary, who's a good friend of mine, <laughs> came to see me and said, uh, you know, what we really need to do is overhaul our procurement system because of so much corruption, right? And the first thing we need to do is get a, 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 a new law passed. That would simply overhaul everything, right? And I told them, hmm, I don't know anything about this, Mr. Secretary. I, I don't know how to do this stuff or whatnot, you know? Uh, but I said, well, neither do we. So, you know, <laughs> So that set off this journey. I literally went on a four-year journey, you know, learning how to actually, you know, form coalitions and get people, mobilize people, you know, to actually move forward and, and achieve a goal. And, and literally, we had a small team, and uh, we were literally learning day to day. Because we, you know, if I knew then what I was talking to you about yesterday. Uh, we would have a you know, we would have had a lot easier time because we would have said ah this is a particular type of problem here's how we need to solve that right well we were struggling you know uh, so so I would like to share that story with you uh, for two reasons one you know to just to, 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 to illustrate you know demonstrate you know the application actually of some of the to, uh, tools and concepts we learned yesterday and number two basically uh, you know get you to understand that you know reforms you know, are not easy, and you're just going to have to kind of struggle through it day in and day out, you know. There will be times when you just want to give up, you know. But the thing is, you know, once you give up, it's, end of, it's the end of the game, you know. So, you, you, you know, those days when you feel like, oh, shit, let's just throw in the towel, you just got to tell yourself, ah, ah, let's just move ahead, okay? All right, 
So let me start my, uh, my little story here. Uh, so let's start with a very familiar diagram or a, a slide, right? Uh, remember this? this is a, from yesterday, status quo, bad equilibrium. All right? I mean, uh, you know, uh, we, the World Bank, you know, and many donors are very good at, at basically analyzing this. Many reports that we prepare that basically lay out what's wrong. In this case, what's wrong with the procurement system. Right? Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, before I come in, well, about the same time as I came in, uh, uh, no, shortly before I came in, uh, the secretary had already contracted uh, USAID to bring in two, two top-notch procurement consultants, you know, to literally dissect and diagnose, you know, the procurement system of the Philippines. And they came up with a 400-page document that went through every nook and cranny. Every, I mean, it was I called it the Bible. You know, it really laid out everything that was wrong with our system. Okay? And it also then produced a whole list of stuff that needed to be done to, to kind of fix it up and bring it up to a more efficient system, you know, which was this, you know, the desired equilibrium. You know, this is what your procurement system ought to look like, right? Okay, now, typically, what happens in something like this, you know, if, if this were given to, okay, if the, if the country would approach the World Bank, you know, and said, okay, can you help us with this, right? What we would do, the World Bank, is give them a package, yeah? Package of, we'll lend you some money, we'll provide some technical assistance, but here's what we need from you, conditionality. We call it conditionalities uh, of sorts. They call it all sorts of triggers, or whatever. in effect, they're conditionalities, right? And it's all wrapped uh, within this, remember this picture that I drew you? A very predictable linear process, you know, uh, where you basically have very well-defined basis, right? Now, what do we know is the problem with that? From yesterday, what is the problem with that? Research, 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 research. No, yeah, well, back up. Even even before that, what what is the problem with that approach? Right? Life isn't linear. Yeah, it's not it's not linear, right? In fact, the real problem is how how do you actually move from so called this really bad state to this sort of this hard state, right? And it's that's completely unpredictable. It's not completely, but a lot of it is unpredictable, right? There's a lot of uncertainty on. It. But also, how do you know that your desired state is a desired state? Well, basically, you, you, have, yeah, you have to agree with the country, that's their goal. Here's where we want to go, right? I mean, and it could be, you know, it could be, you know, X, it could be Y, it could be Z, but that's, that's where they want to go, right? And the reason, the reason we as donors kind of give them, here's what's best practice or good practice, you know, around the world is to give them a menu of stuff, right? And then they basically, the government says, okay, here's where we want to go. Okay? And sometimes it's not sort of where, where uh, perhaps you know the, the most ideal you know uh, situation uh, uh, is where they want to go, but that's okay, you know, as long as there's there's sort of a, an improvement, right? And that's that's how it's done. Well, when you negotiate and all that, it's it's sort of the state of which uh, uh, sort of the target state, okay? And so the challenge, therefore, is you know. Uh, it's not so much, uh, you know, this, uh, this finance, this TA, this whatnot, this conditionality, it's just those things we know don't work very well, right? And then, I mean, in the end, you know, we've had, the, you know, quite a few uh, problems with that approach. And, and the reason is that because the real challenge is in the how. The elephant in the room is in the how. How do you get from one to the other? And that's literally what my team was being asked to do. By the way, I didn't come in as a bank staff. I had to go and leave from the World Bank to do this stuff because back then they would look at me and say, "No, you can't do that." You know, <laughs> back then the bank that was that was not a no no. So I said, "Okay, so I'm going to go and leave, and I'm just going to do this stuff, and that way you can you guys can watch from the sidelines and see what's happening." Okay, so all right, so let's continue on with a little story. Now the background to this uh, was uh, really had to do with uh, the uh, campaign of the, the then uh, you know uh, the new president. He, um, uh, you know he campaigned. Uh, part of his campaign was a bit, was on anti-corruption. I'm going to fight corruption, right? And you know um, 
he, uh, a lot of people thought that you know because he was he did not come from the typical elite class that in fact you know he would he would be able to do this you know so so that was a, 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 a major pillar of his campaign you know and uh, so the secretary of the budget said well you know let's help him we need to help him meet meet his you know sort of his commitments you know and in this case you know uh, we should tackle procurement okay uh, because there's so much corruption in, in, uh, in, in, in procurement and if we can show that we can make a dent in that it would actually speak well of the president's sort of uh, you know uh, the current presidency okay? now just as a background uh, you know uh, you know um, this is a transparency. No, this is the the uh, Kaufman Cray, but uh, Transparency International uh, uh, has a similar uh, index. The Kaufman Cray index, basically, uh, this is on uh, a control of corruption. So Philippines was somewhat in the middle. This was 2002. It's a little lower in 1998. You know, uh, but the the concern was really not so much. Well, you know, we're somewhere in the middle, but. You know, what, what, why are we kind of compared to you know, Timor, East Timor, or, or Vietnam, or, or, or China in terms of corruption? We're not as corrupt as those, those, those countries. That was always kind of the discussion within country, you know? And, uh, and in the press, really, corruption was really always, you know, there was always something about corruption. Okay, so it was, it was a high-profile kind of issue. So, that, so that's why it became, uh, you know, uh, uh, imperative why, in fact, uh, you know, we needed to do something about uh, uh, about now, uh, let me uh, 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 let me uh, sort of uh, because people ask me, you know, well, why do you guys choose procurement? Why not why not something else? Right. Uh, the reason was uh, um, I'll tell you the reason is for why you know. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, as a background to this, you know, um, when we were discussing what it is we needed to do on corruption. You know, um, the consensus was that we needed to actually focus. Right? Why? Well, you know, most governments, certainly developing country governments, you know, don't have enough resources to tackle corrupt er all corruption. Just don't. Yeah. You know? And unfortunately, that's what a lot of countries try to do because of donors pressuring them and all that. You got to corrupt, uh, tackle corruption in every nook and cranny. And that's always been the sort of the approach of the donors, right? Uh, and I call that kind of the <laughs> shotgun approach, right? Because uh, you know, you try and shoot this. this uh, corruption is like this Great Wall of China; it's all over the place, right? <laughs> and you have resources that are so minuscule. You, you shoot it with this pellet gun. What do you think happens? Nothing, right? Well, nothing. Yeah. You know? It's not that the government hasn't tried. It's just that the government doesn't have enough resources to do it, right? If you're the U.S., if you're Denmark, if you're Germany, you've got a lot more resources to actually combat corruption. But not the, not the poor countries, you know. So, so this the sort of shotgun approach trying to do everything, you know, uh, to combat corruption just simply won't work. You know, that's reality. So, so the idea was, like, okay, then maybe what we need to do is do a laser beam approach, right? Unfortunately, I don't have a laser beam, so... <laughs> <laughs> what it is, is uh, you focus, right? You focus on a part of the wall where you think there's some kind of a crack, and just keep on pounding at it, you know? And hopefully you can crack the wall. If you can crack the wall, then you can begin to get the, the, the uh, you know, to, 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 you can get the wall to crumble, you know, eventually. So that, that's, that's kind of the, the metaphor here, right? And that's why we ended up with, okay, we can do all sorts of things, but no, we're gonna do procurement, you know? Because procurement, that's, that's a major, major uh, uh, you know, uh, source of corruption. All right. So. This was the bad equilibrium, you know? Uh, you know, um, every year, uh, we actually have a, a very good, uh, uh, survey companies in, in the Philippines, uh, especially the, the, you know, we have one that actually does a lot of social surveys, right? And every year they would conduct a survey of you know most corrupt agencies in in, in the country and all that. And we just took a sample, you know, back in this was in 1990, in 1998 actually, uh, 
1999. Um, uh, four of the top five most corrupt agencies were actually, you know, uh, the top procurement, the top agencies that, that uh, in terms of procurement. Right. So, so you knew right away that uh -uh, you know, procurement was a major issue. Right. The only one that was actually, uh, you know, the, the, the actually uh, 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 outdid everyone else was the revenue agency, <laughs> the tax agency. We also tackled them and we lost that battle. And I, I can talk about that at some other time. You know? uh, there were also a lot of lessons to that. Uh, now, uh, and they also asked, you know, in this survey, they also asked businessmen how much he paid in terms of, uh, you know, of kickbacks. And you would get an average, and then that year it was about 20%. So, you know, we just in, in 2001, we just, for kicks, we said, okay, uh, uh, let's, because I, we we, I was with the Department of Budget Management, said so they had all this information of how much was going to be procured during the year, right? I mean, it's the budget test. So, let's take all of that, you know, the, the plans of the national government, procurement plans, and let's just apply 20% to that. That's what's going to be lost through, through, through corruption, right? And it would amount to 21 billion pesos. Which roughly is about uh, the budget of the health ministry, right? So can you imagine that? You know the the amount of corruption in procurement is equivalent to you know the, the, the you know the, the budget of, of one of the major ministries, right? How many hospitals can um, how many clinics can you you know uh, build new clinics can you build, right? How many new new doctors can you actually send? How many nurses and that sort of thing? There's so there's so much loss in the process. So. So that just give you a, a sense of what the problem was, you know? What is BOT? Ah, build, operate, transfer. These are what I call public, uh, are now called public-private partnerships, you know? If you think the procurement problems in, you know, that pertain to regular contacts with government are bad, are, are a problem, wait till you get to public-private partnerships. You know, the losses there are even much greater than that. Much, much greater, you know? And the reason for it is because they're very complex. Public-private partners, the contracts for those, very complex. You know? And a lot of times, the government does not really have the, the, the lawyers who can actually sort through that in, you know, in, in a good way. And then, of course, the, the private firms who are all multinationals, they have the best lawyers in town. So what happens is that the government gets, uh, gets screwed in a way. And it's also because, and because it's, it's, it's complex, it's, it, you're able to hide a lot of things, you know, that basically are side payments, right? So, so basically, this didn't even include the build, operate, transfer transactions. So, if you added build, operate transactions, it would be much, much larger. Okay. okay. The other thing which uh, we discovered was this: the legal foundations were a real mess. There's so many laws, decrees, you know, whatever, you know. Uh, executive orders that govern the, you know, uh, uh, procurement. Now imagine if you have all these laws, uh, you know, uh, some are basically inconsistent with each other, you know, that basically is the legal foundation for your procurement, yeah? you you basically have a, you know, a free-for-all. You can do a free-for-all on that one because, you know, it's so complex, nobody understands this. What you can do is, okay, if I use this, this, this law, it will be favorable to me, so we'll use that, you know. <laughs> it's that kind of thing. It's, it, it's very messy. Right? In fact, um, um, I like telling the story because uh, you know, I, I, uh, you know, uh, one, one of the agencies that we had to work with was our audit agency, the Supreme Audit Institution, yeah, the Commission Audit, and uh, and they were telling us that they actually have something like twelve volumes, twelve volumes, you know, print boxes, uh, really of of decrees, of executive orders, of you know, whatever it is, on procurement alone, on procurement alone, okay. Right? So imagine if you were trying to put together a bid, you know, a, a procurement bid, you know, uh, it'd be almost impossible for you to actually figure out what what actually met, you know, uh, met, uh, you know the the the, uh, the, uh, the the legal standards, right? Yeah. And so, uh, as to be expected, that really resulted in a lot of hanky uh, uh, panky and a lot of uh, corruption. All right. So. Anyway, what was the desired equilibrium then? So, uh, there's so many things I can say about this, but you know, just in terms of the uh, of the time, okay, in terms of the uh, the, the length of time to do a, a procurement, 
the idea was to be able to reduce it from, this is civil wars, this is infrastructure, to seven and a half to 12 months. You know, this is just to bid, right? To bid the thing. Seven and a half to 12 months, that's how long it took, right? And, and anyone who's done procurement will probably say, ah, why did it take that long, right? Uh, down to two to three months, right? And that would at least be, you know, more reasonable. And that was the idea, okay? And then at the same time, to introduce this rather, at that, at that point in time, radical idea of uh, enabling the civil society organizations to monitor you know, the procurement process. Okay? And back then, that was completely unheard of. You know? why, why, why do you want to get engaged to CSOs you know, on this? You know? This was back in 1998. And back then, the World Bank wasn't even dealing with this stuff. You know? uh, so so that, was the, that, that was the essence of the desired state. Sorry, the equilibrium, the new law. Okay. Now, knowing what I just told you about the problems with the uh, with the law, the, the legal foundation, and all that, you know, I think uh, you know uh, it wouldn't be hard to uh, figure out that uh, there's probably a lot of vested interest, right, in this, and that the road from one to the other would be pretty tough. Now we knew that was going to be tough. In fact, when we started. People were saying, oh, you guys are just going to be wasting your time. You guys are just, you know, this, this, this. nobody's ever done this before. So, you know, you just pack your bags and, you know, just, just go home. Because this is not going to happen. This is what people were telling us then, you know, both inside government and outside. Uh, well, we said, well, we'll go ahead and do it anyway. And the basic idea, and I can talk about this now in hindsight, was, to actually create what we call the well-oiled machine that could actually deal with this how, you know? Manage the politics of this process, right? And today we call this a reform coalition. That's really what is at the heart of this. Getting a coalition to be able to move this process forward. It cannot be done by one person, two people, or whatever. It's got about a multitude of people that need to be helping in this process. Right? Okay. That's a challenge. Uh, it's not easy to do that. No? Uh, okay, so let me tell you the story then of how we actually ended up doing that. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm able to do this uh, by virtue of hindsight. You know, when I was doing this, when my team was uh, in, engaged in this, we were going day to day. We were just learning through the process. Okay, so. We didn't even have the virtue of what we call now stakeholder mapping. That didn't exist in my radar screen at all, you know. But 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 we had somewhat of a, I guess a, a, an informal rough uh, rough methodology for doing because we would talk with each other and that sort of thing. You know? uh, but if we were to reconstruct, you know, all those conversations, all the discussions, it would look like the stakeholder map, something like this. This is even a very you know. It's a relatively simplistic map, you know, there's, you could populate this with a lot more players, right? And these are the different kind of stakeholders, you know, that were involved that, uh, in here. You know, that would be, you know, uh, interested one way or another in, 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 in this kind of uh, reform process, you know? So, uh, over here is the, the, the interest of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the group. And over there's the influence. You can, you can you think of this as the, uh, the position, or the strength of position of, uh, of the uh, different groups. And here would be the, uh, the influence, right? Okay, so over here, the interest is completely <laughs> on the other side. I don't want this to happen, right? Uh, and uh, and uh, you know, over here, down here, you have very little influence, okay? That was kind of the initial state of play. That's what it looked like, yeah. Uh, well, you know, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you all about that. At least he wasn't there, okay? He was, he was somewhat on the side, yeah? But uh, uh, he, got, he got impeached on corruption, by the way. <laughs> so, I'll tell you about the story, maybe. You're getting a little ahead of the story, so. Uh, uh, so anyway, it's, uh, this is what it looked like, right? Just, uh, you know, if you, if you wanted to piece together all those conversations we had. So the, the strategy was then, all right, how can we do two things? You know, one, how can we move some of these folks here closer 
to this. You'll get them a little more sympathetic, right? So that was one piece. And then the other piece was, how can we get some of these folks who are strong interest be more influential, right? That was the strategy. How can we do that, right? Because if we manage to do, you know, if we manage to do this, right, uh, the battle in the legislature uh, would be much more even, let's put it that way. Okay? Why were the rural congressmen so negative? Were they the ones most directly benefiting? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. Yeah, that, that, it's a very interesting. We discovered that you know later on in the game. Actually, oh, we thought we maybe said, oh, they, all these congressmen will be against it. That that wasn't the case actually. I'll, I'll get to that. There's an interesting story behind that. Okay, so uh, in the end, this is this is this is what we wanted things to look like, you know, and then the core coalition would be look something like that. These are kind of the folks we need to get on our side if we are to have, you know, uh, at least an even chance of winning that battle in the legislature. Okay? All right. So, with that as a background, let us begin the story. Okay? Creating a reform coalition. So, uh, just think about it in terms of uh, here are four steps uh, or four four sequential uh, you know, uh, uh, questions, you know. First is, you know, at least in this context, you know, how, how to unify the executive, right? And the, the problem in the Philippines, you know, uh, is that if an, the executive you know, proposes a bill to the, to the Congress, right? And if they're not unified, guess what happens? Yeah? It won't pass. Why won't it be passed? Most likely it won't be passed. What do you think the congressman will be doing in the senators? Divide and conquer. Yeah, exactly. They'll be playing one against the other and all that. And before you know it, even if a bill is passed, you know, it'll be watered down. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's, so, so, you, so the first task was, hey, guys, we got to, when we get there, when we get to the legislature, we've got the, the whole executive needs to be unified behind this. All right, so that was the first task. The second was, well, we're going to need to mobilize civil society, right? Because, um, you know, if, if you don't have, have civil society with you here, you know, it's going to look like, well, this is just an executive thing and uh, whatnot. Uh, the people are not really interested in this, so, so why should we even act on it? Because, uh, you know, the legislators, they just want to get reelected, right? And if there's no if they don't see any kind of action, you know, from the electorate, they're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna be too responsive to this, right? So that's why that was very important. Okay. Now, related to that was, you know, um, and this is where people miss out, right? Is that we needed to be able to link the civil society organizations with the reformers in government. A lot of reform efforts miss this point. And I can tell you, if you don't get this right, it's not going to succeed. There's got to be that link between the reformers in government and civil society organizations. Okay. And that's not easy to do, but it can be done. Right? Yeah. If, does, if that link or willingness does not exist, so then we need to do something about it. Well, you know, I. I I always think that, you know, uh, uh, there are always people in government, you know, who have an interest in doing, you know, doing good, right? Now, you may not be able to tackle the, a big elephant, but you may be able to tackle a little elephant, or you may be able to tackle something small, you know, but uh, you'll have to adjust your, you know, your, your goals, right? I mean, uh, I certainly don't believe that you can't find anyone in government that, that uh, with, uh, with, uh, so it's more to do with on the civil society part, like critiques, like for example, up from at least some <laughs> it's a white country. Yeah, they are not that interested to to join in with the government. Well, you see, this is or actually part, okay. I, uh, let me respond to that. Yeah, you know, uh, this is the problem I have sometimes with uh, some of this uh, this, this so-called uh, you know do good NGOs, right? Uh, the, the, the perspective is that, you know, government is bad and we have to knock your head on the wall, right? And they keep on knocking, knocking and all that, right? Well, guess what? 
as you as, as they keep on knocking and knocking, guess what the government does, you know? It keeps on increasing yeah. its its resistance to it, you know? Mm -hmm. And nothing happens, right? So why continue to do that if it, if all that does is just it just creates barriers, right? So, well, I mean uh, we convince them otherwise. Okay. Yeah. We convince them otherwise. Right, we'll get to the CSO. Yeah. You know, the thing is that's what that's what mobilization means, right? Mobilization means that you know some of the people there may not be doing stuff that that that, that you think is actually uh, suited for the situation. You're gonna have to go there and kind of talk to the big guys, you know. I mean, if you continue to do this, nothing's gonna happen, and there's got to be a lot of that kind of effort. I mean, this is not a, a, a walk in the in the park. This is a lot of hard work. There are people there who are just going to wait for you and say, okay, convince me. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and it takes a lot of effort to do that. This is why reform, you know, you know, coalition building is not easy. It's not just a matter of putting puzzles together. It, it, it is hard work. Yeah? yeah. Well, the case of Kuwait, I mean, it's really tricky because CSOs are legally under the umbrella of the government. Mm -hmm. So technically they're fucked under the government. Wow. <laughs> then, then, and the ones that found a way to, let's say, cheat the system, yeah. uh, they've registered themselves as private companies. Yeah. And even then, they're also profits of the government because they get some kind of uh, support yeah. legally yeah. or yeah. pensions and so on and so forth. <laughs> so they don't talk against the government. Although they're really good and they're staffed well and so on yeah. and so forth, but they won't take the risk to get a cut off in support. Well, they're not CSOs in the real name of work. <laughs> Essentially, they're 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 uh, what they call the appendices of the government or something like that. Right? But then again, everyone has an agenda. I mean, in yeah. Iran, every, yeah. end, every politician has an NGO, a telecom company, and a satellite TV. And, you know, in that situation, I would think about okay, this is the situation, right? Okay, what is it that we can do given that situation? Right? I mean, it's it's I mean. Uh, you, Use your creativity and how that can be done, right? Before the reform in the Philippines, was there such thing as Greece money allowed legally for contracts or not? No, 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 no. Everything was, I mean, that, that, that was corrupt. corrupt. In the US, there is Greece money, right? Legally? Yeah. Uh, contracts, I think it's like 2% or I don't know, less. No, I, I don't think so. I mean, uh, there, there are other ways in which it's done. You know, you kind of uh, you know, send the senator's wife or you know, whatever it is for for trips abroad and that sort of thing, you know, I mean, uh, and, uh, that's, that's kind of in a gray area, you know, but handing money out, ha, 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 yeah, that's absolutely against the law yeah. in the U.S. Yeah. That doesn't happen. Yeah. I think this time that would work better in the democracies, because maybe not other kinds of things, but those things. Well, you know, well, you know I, let me tell you about this, you know, um, when, you, when you think about Singapore, right, you think about Singapore as being a dictatorship and all that sort of thing. Well, guess what? You know, Singapore actually has, you know, purposefully, you know, uh, had, you know, uh, you know, uh, what we call the equivalent of civil society uh, groups created, you know, uh, so that there would be a, a, a discussion. There could be a discussion between government and civil society. There's a lot of that in Singapore from the very beginning, because it was viewed that uh, that in fact, you know. Information, you know, could only come from people who are affected by whatever the problem was, right? So there, that's why there's a lot of surveys. The government conducts a lot of surveys in Singapore. You know, even their housing development uh, complexes, they have associations, and those associations are the source of actually, you know, of problem solving. One of the problems. It's not quite, you know, a democracy as we see it, but there is that interaction, and there is the recognition that you know. They just can't be puppets, puppets, because their puppets will never find out, you know, what the real problems are. Okay, so I mean, I think you need to be clear about that. I mean, uh, uh, so it, well, anyway, I mean, this is this is uh, the Philippines is one of the most you know, democratic, uh, you know, countries in the world in hey. the sense that it's very open, right? Yeah. One quick point, just to say that civil society is not just the traditional NGOs; yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's the right. associational life yeah. between your private life and the government. Yeah. So churches, mosques, yeah. professional yeah. associations, yeah. all kinds of groupings are civil society, yeah. in any society. Mm -hmm. And they can be mobilized for all kinds of purposes. Exactly. Yeah. In fact, uh, that, uh, the church is a key player in this. Huh? And then finally, because this is about getting a law passed, you don't have to find 
uh, champions, I put it in court and I'll define what I mean by champions, you know, in the legislature. You, know? you got to get people in the legislature willing to actually make this happen. If you can't do that, then you, know, you can't get the law passed. Right? So this is the kind of the, 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 the four kind of headline stuff that we needed to do. So let's start with the first, unifying the executive. You know? So uh, essentially here, what we needed to do, we decided was we needed to get the experts, procurement experts in government onto the table. Because if you could get them onto the table and then they said, yeah, we have to do this, that led, you know, a lot of credibility to the process. Because these are the people who really understand procurement in government. Right? Unfortunately, we started with a huge deficit on that one. I call this the ditch. We started out from ditch, not from ground level, from the ditch. And what was this ditch? Remember I told you about this two procurement reform consultants, uh, experts who were brought in by USAID? They did a wonderful job with the analysis. Totally, I mean, it was this, I mean, I still have a copy of that document, 400 page you know, document. But they also did something which should never have been done, right? When they went to talk to the different, you know, uh, experts or whatnot, they talked down to them. Mm -hmm. Said, you need to do this. Boom, yeah, okay? Uh, including, including the undersecretary of the Department of Budget and Management was put in charge of this program, you know? Well, guess what happened? You know? What happened to this big 400-page document? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> shelved. Just completely shelved, right? And not only that, a lot of people just didn't want to get involved in this because they got so pissed off, right? So that was our starting point, right? So, <laughs> So, so here, sort of the, here are the experts. They don't want to have anything to do with this procurement reform process because you know they've already been burned. You know, so how do we get them back onto the table? Okay, uh, what were the problems associated with this? Okay, well, first of all, you know, there's no, none of them had any shared vision of where this was going, right? If at all they, they you know, they said, well, I don't, I don't even want to get involved in this, right? Secondly. There's always this problem of the free rider, okay? They were, I mean, implicit, but not implicit. Some people were thinking actually, well, what, you know, just let the Department of Budget and Management do it, and then, then if they succeed, then we all benefit from it, right? I mean, that's a free rider problem, right? Yeah. And then uh, finally, there's a lack of trust, right? These people, while they might know each other, they never really work together, right? And so you know. Uh, even if you're willing to give the benefit of the doubt, there's still that element of, well, you know, should I really be working with this, with this person, with this person, with this person? Mm -hmm. right, so that, that's kind of the situation that you need to confront. You know? So how did, we, how did we manage to address that? And, he, and this is, again, here, you know, this is, this is one way to do it, right? I mean, uh, and in different situations, you're just going to have to figure out how to address this, you know, this sorts of issues, right? But this came up. This literally came up, right? So how do we do that? Okay, what we decided to do was conduct what we call a shoot down workshop. Okay. Shoot down because uh, the thinking in the team was that, well, since they, since they hate this document so much, since they despise the whole process in, within which this document was prepared and kind of discussed, right? Why don't we ask them to come to a workshop to shoot down the document, right? You know, vent your anger on this or something like that. That was just a strategy, right? We were just thinking that maybe this will work. It's an experiment, you know? And uh, we, we were expecting maybe, maybe if, if we get half of these people to show up, you know, it'd be great. In fact, you know, practically everyone showed up. About 60 of them showed up to this workshop, right? And for three days, we were locked in a hotel and we went section by section by section, you know, not, not details, but section by section, sort of saying, okay, what, you know, what, you know, what should be the principles that govern this section? And let's ignore this, uh, you know, all the detailed stuff that was done, you know? And, you know, we actually went through that. It was a painstaking process. It was eight, nine hours a day, you know, we were locked up for three days. And in the end, we ended up with, you know, a, a, Basically, a document that said D for each of the sections. These are the principles that ought to govern this section, right? And from there, 
uh, we uh, discussed with them, well, would you like to continue this process then, you know, because we, we just had principles, we now need to fill that up, right? And they said, well, uh, they, they said, okay, we're, you know, why don't we have another, uh, another workshop? And this really translated into a series of workshops, you know, uh, which really threshed out, you know, each of these things in details. In fact, it, it separated into three different uh, uh, categories. One was civil works infrastructure, one was on goods, and one was on uh, consulting services, right? And again, going through this in, in detail, filling that up, and, and preparing what ended up being executive orders. Yeah? Executive orders are those that, that the, the president can just sign on. The idea there was to, to, to use that process to basically, you know, um, and get get this individuals to become a tight team. Remember, I explained to you how do you how do you help build trust? How can you possibly, you know, uh, you know, address uh, the free rider problem? You know, uh, how do you get a vision, for instance? You know? A lot of that has to do with basically bringing people together, you know, to work together, and you know, constantly. There has to be a repeated interaction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the consultants by that time were. Oh, all they were out. They were alone. Uh, they, were out. <laughs> they, they left, you know, and we didn't want to have anything to do with them. We didn't even want to see them because they yeah. were just bad news. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The consultants, the the, 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 the world. Oh, in fact, it was funny because there's a man and a woman, and they, the the the, 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 the people called them sir and lady because they were all stuck down to, to that. So, you know, uh, uh, anyway, so this ended up being a series of workshops, you know, um, and, and through that series of workshops, you you could you could see who were really really you know committed to this. We ended up with about uh, twenty of the 60 who really said, we're really prepared to work on this. And true enough, I mean, and good enough, you know, they actually came from the major spending agencies. All right, so that was good enough for us, yeah. At that time, what was, uh, what did those who wanted to keep the old order, uh, what were they doing? <laughs> they didn't know we were doing this. <laughs> they didn't know we were doing this. This is all very done, very, Quietly, systematically, you know? So they weren't aware of what was happening at all. Under the water line. Huh? Under the water. Yeah, under the water line. I mean, we were doing, because, you know, the moment you announce this stuff, oh, you're dead in the water right away. They're going to be up, because, uh, you know, and I'll tell you why. I mean, uh, because they're, they're, they're geared up to actually fight you from, you know, day one, and they're, they're well organized to do that. Okay? So, uh, anyway, we ended up, getting this 20 experts to become a technical working group. They formed a technical working group, right? And that was to them, that was their fraternity. You know? That was the embodiment of their sort of their dedication, their motivation, their efforts, right? So, uh, um, now, the challenge, of course, is how do you then go from there to actually the executive? Remember, these are just the experts. So we've now we now got the experts to say, okay, let's just move on. Let's let's push this forward. Okay? Now, the virtue of getting government folks involved, in particular procurement experts, is they have knowledge of what went on in the past. Right? Now, one of the things that came up was when we were discussing this was uh, a couple of them said, you know what? There was there is this uh, Mori bond. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what they call this committee, a uh, board, you know? It's uh, called uh, the, the Government Procurement Policy Board. It was created under President Marcos 20 years ago, right? It had a legal status, but then it kind of became dormant. People just didn't use it anymore, that sort of thing, and so it just was shelved in some sense, right? But it had legal status, right? In what sense? Well, they, they were, there was already a legal, uh, there was a law that created it, and it, you know, and, and, and as, as far as uh, uh, as far as the law is concerned, it still existed, right? Except that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't functioning. So we said, okay, if that's the case. All it needs is uh, an order from the president reviving it. We didn't have to go to the legislature. We didn't have to do that, yeah. And the, and so what the technical working group did was uh, let us 
proposed to our respective principals that we provide this and that the technical working group becomes the second target to this. And that's what happened. Okay? And then the Government Procurement Policy Board became the sole mouthpiece for procurement reform efforts, you know, uh, at least mouthpiece for the government. Yeah. Do you think if you hadn't had that entity there, that you would have by this time gained enough traction to have actually had a law enacted? Not at that point. This was very critical. And I'll tell you why. Uh, uh, when you get to the legislature, you're going to have to propose, right? The executive needs to propose this bill. Right? Right? Because we had this, one reason, one reason why this is very important is, is because there was this GPPB, the president could say, that's the, one, that's the institution that will speak for anything on procurement reform. Okay, so the legislature was then obliged to basically just, you know, engage with this one. Right, so it, there's one voice, right, and that solved one big problem. Okay. Uh, the other, of course, is it, it you know, it, it brought it enlarged the authorizing environment, right, because the, the members of the government procurement policy board were ministers, uh, and they, yeah, <laughs> criteria of selecting those government experts. None. We just we just identified who were. The, the, so, uh, who are the procurement experts in each of the agencies? So-called sort of known, the known gurus in the procurement. You know, that we just said they may have uh, names. With, uh, well, we knew that. We knew that. Uh, uh, you can't, you know, you, you can't sort of just. You just have to kind of do something, and then in the process, you know, if they have links or whatnot, they, you know, chances are they would continue to because this is a lot of work, right? They would just drop out. They might, you know, they might tell people that this was happening, you know. But you would know through the process because it's a costly process for them, right? Who are actually really prepared to actually you know, get the work done? So the president nominated the members for the GPPB. No, it's by law. The law already specified who would be the members. It, it would be chaired by the secretary of the Department of Budget Management and the, and the uh, secretary of the National Party Board, right? And then um, are these politicians? No, no. These are these these are like the equivalent of the permanent secretaries you know, in the British system. Uh, in the American system, the, you know, um, the, the secretaries are not elected or anything like that. They're appointed, right? And, and, uh, they're not quite like the permanent secretaries where they have tenure for life, but, you know. Political appointments. They're political appointments. So, um, uh, but it, it, you know, the law specifies the position, not the individual, right? So if the secretary of public work needs to be there, the secretary of education needs to be there, the secretary of all the big spending agencies need to be there. So how did the 20 what do you mean? To, no, the 20 techni the, the technical around. Well, you had people from the military, you had people from other agencies in the technical working group. And you okay. said the technical working group became the secretary. Yeah, well, it became the secretary for that. What's this? Where did the people the responsibility? Oh, this one here? Well, it, you know, it just as part of the, the, uh, the decree, the, the presidential decree, it just says, well, reviving the GPPB, we need a secretariat, you know, the current technical working group working on this, you know. Is, is henceforth, you know, designated as a secretary to this. Simple, right? Mm -hmm. And because the president, see, what was interesting about this president, it was President Estrada, is, you know, and in fact, when he was being impeached, he always said, I never stole money from the government, mm -hmm. right? Which is true. For as far as he is concerned, you know, as long as he didn't touch the budget, he wasn't stealing anything, right? So which is true, he never touched the budget. So as far as he is concerned, this procurement, go ahead and do it. Yeah, because it, it didn't affect, uh, you know, his, his side payments, you know. His side payments were all on the state capture side, right? It wasn't on the administrative corruption side, right? So he said, go ahead, it did good for me, good for you, go ahead. So that, that's how we, and, and look, I mean, I mean, in, in reforms, you have to play the game the way that you can play it, right? And if this was the way we, we could get the, the, the law passed, well, we'll play that game, right? Uh, so that's what happened. Right? <laughs> anyway, okay. Excuse me. Yeah. I think she asked a very interesting yeah. question. We have uh, 20 members in the technical yeah. working group. How were they participating in those uh, that uh, Was it? Uh, they did all the work. Uh, yeah. The 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 the, the secretaries would just meet maybe 
once every quarter or whatnot, just to you know sort of sign off on things and all that. But the thing is, the respective members of those in the, in the technical working group would already brief their principals even before the board meeting. So by the time you got the board meeting, you know there was really nothing much to discuss. It was just more formality. Let's sign on, and then they go off and you know drink coffee and eat and that sort of thing. So what was what was this became an instrumentality. What was really moving this was a technical working group. That was it. Mm -hmm. uh, this is based on the previous question that Stephen asked about the government experts. You said that they were, were not interested in the drop out. But wouldn't they want to continue to be as an insider to get the insider information? Some of them well, there was a, I think there was at least one of those, you know. But what, see, what is interesting is people eventually, you know, kind of discovered that by, by the interactions, right? And this one person who was really you know, just obnoxious and all that, you know, he became marginalized. Mm. They just marginalized him. There was peer pressure, really, to just marginalize him. You could see it, you know, but when the guys speak up, people, and then they would move on. Okay, what's next? And then, you know, some of the more senior members of this who were really truly respected put him under control. You know, so so uh, these are things that you know you, you can't you can't predict. You know, they say you just have to. You have to flow, go with the flow, and then within that context, kind of figure out what to do. And in this case, we knew that the, the sort of the really respected gurus in government, you know, the, the, the one of the undersecretaries in the public works, you know, one, uh, one, under, uh, one director in the uh, Department of Budget and Management, and uh, a, uh, a director at the planning board, these were the key people. And if if uh, if there was a question in civil works, go to that guy. You know, you know he knows what to do. If there's a question in consulting services, go to that guy at Meta. You know, the planning board. He would know. You know, if it was on, on on goods and supplies, well, go to that guy at, uh, at the department budget management. Yeah, I'm just thinking about the incentive mechanism because it's a huge amount of money involved in this. The well, I mean, this is true. I mean, the thing is. Uh, you have to approach this in a very practical way, you know? Uh, and uh, you'd be surprised that some of these people, actually the, the, the 20, when you actually talk to them, you know, you know, they've been wanting to do something like this for many, many years, but just were, didn't know, they didn't have the vehicle to do it. They didn't have the instrumentality to do it. So when this came up, they just jumped at it. No, so, so in a way, there are people like that in government. The process that we put in place help kind of filter those folks. You have to put something down in place. I mean, I mean, in any situation, you're going to say, okay, there are going to be good people, but how do we find those folks? Right? You have to create that, that process. This is part of coalition building. Right? Okay. All right, now. How to mobilize civil society. Okay. Now. It's probably true in many of our uh, uh, countries, you know. Uh, even in the Philippines, you know, where there's, well, maybe because it's <laughs> in the Philippines, so many civil society organizations, very diffuse, you know, uh, and different agendas and all that, right? Uh, and the, the real problem was that uh, there were two problems with it. You know? uh, one is uh, there's a free rider problem here again. Right, and because you know, uh, why should I get engaged in this? You know, let let somebody else do this, and if they succeed in this, then I can I can do my transparency work better. I can do my accountability work better. Right? There is that free rider problem. This is hard work, so you know, CSOs would rather not. You know, if they could, you know, uh, they would you know prefer that, uh, or at least there is some preference that, that uh, maybe some of the some of the more uh, uh, motivated ones would, would take the cudgels. Right. Uh, but secondly, I think the more important prob uh, uh, problem to address uh, is the problem of as asymmetric information. Okay? And this is, gets to the vested interests issue. Okay. In, in practically, in most situations, things look like this, you know? You've got the vested interests, right? In this case, procurement. You can bet your life. They know the system in and out. Every step of the process, every link, they know that, right? If they have any inkling at all that there's a law coming in here, uh, they know right away where they're going to hit, right? Okay. 
go to the other side of the fence, you know, you have a lot of CSOs, NGOs, who want to do good, right? But most of the time, what do they do? They just, what people say, they make noise. You say, we need to fight corruption. There is corruption in procurement, blah, blah, blah. It ends there. Because they don't understand the system. They have no understanding of the system. So how can they then fight back in some credible way if they don't understand the system? That's an asymmetry of information problem. Right? And until you're able to rebalance that, you know, you know, the fight is quite uneven. Okay? All right. I have a question. Yeah. Um, did, you, did you choose specific uh, NGOs and was there a problem of, apart from NGOs not really understanding the details of the matter, was procurement seen as some dry, non-important topic that didn't really match any of the sort of yeah, uh, pet, yeah. pet uh, projects or well, you know, they, sexy topics? They kind of thought that procurement were. was a problem because it had corruption, but they also kind of thought it was boring. I want to work on that. <laughs> Warring stuff, you know. You know, we want to work on you know what tax, tax, that, that stuff. That's interesting, you know. That's uh, but procurement is in, uh, largely because it's much more complex to understand. Mm -hmm. Look, uh, the average person doesn't understand what procurement is all about. And you tell them, the, you know, procurement. Well, whoa, whoa, what's that? Right. So it's that issue, right? And uh, usually these uh, NGOs work. Uh, Social yeah. areas and human development, but not in, in this, engineer, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other And even those who work on anti corruption, I, uh, you know, uh, uh, the thing is, you know, unless they actually you know, study this and try to learn the stuff, you know, they really won't know what procurement is all about. It, I mean, it takes a lot of effort. I mean, you know, I mean, procurement is not an easy, an easy thing to get a handle on. You know? uh, so, uh, what uh, what was done was, uh, and this was not our idea. It was it was the idea of uh, of uh, the technical working group. And some of the key players in there said, "Look, look, we need allies. We need allies from outside. Right? If we're going to win this battle, we need allies. You know, because when we go to Congress, you know, we better be able to show that we've got allies in the public. You know, because otherwise we're we're not going to win this battle. So, you know, of course, okay, yeah, we need allies, but." You know, we have this problem, right? How are we going to kind of organize all these CSOs and get them to kind of, you know, coalesce, right? That led to the suggestion that, all right, why don't we suggest that, you know, we create a, an NGO? And this gave birth to Procurement Watch, <coughs> right? And guess who was tasked to actually create this? It was my team. Find people who would be interested in actually setting up, you know, this thing called Procurement Watch. Let's make sure that they're credible folks, and let's make sure that the staff, however small they are, really learn about procurement. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. Really, we were able to, you know, uh, uh, you know, we were able to create a, a, a very reputable board, right? Um, and then we recruited, you know, uh, three, four, four actually four, four fairly young. You know, uh, you know, uh, folks from, from uh, largely from the private sector. Uh, one was a lawyer. One was more of a, a public relations type of person. You know, two key people. And what, what the technical working group did was, you know what? We should just include them in our deliberations. You know, uh, in our deliberations on the details of this executive order, that sort of thing. Because in the process, they will learn what this is all about, yeah? particularly the lawyer. Because a lot of it is legal stuff, right? And that's what happened. You know? uh, and in the end, um, uh, the, the lawyer for Procurement Watch ended up actually doing a lot of the legal you know, uh, work you know, for, uh, for the group, and, and, and including uh, you know, uh, throughout the process leading to the, uh, you know, the, uh, I guess the debates and discussions in the legislature. Okay. So, yeah. No, in fact, we had a real problem with that because the government couldn't, I mean, the government said, well, we can't. There has to be some distance between them and us. We'll work with them, but there has to be some independence. Otherwise, it's not an NGO. Yeah, was it? Then it's not an NGO. Yeah, yeah, right. So, 
So we have to look for money actually to to to, to try and make, you know support this uh, you know, creation of this uh, this NGO. And, and and this is the one thing that actually the World Bank helped on. You know? uh, <laughs> the only thing that the World Bank helped on actually in this process, which was anyway very 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 uh, critical. Uh, at that time, uh, uh, there was a new trust fund. Uh, I don't know if you remember this, uh, Bruno. They, they, they called it right after the uh, the Asian financial crisis. This uh, they called it Asian Trust Fund or something like that. Yeah, there was that, and there was a little provision. And it was very interesting. A little provision in the Asian Trust Fund that that said that uh, the funds could also be allocated to civil society organizations, you know, provided the government endorses it. It was something to that effect. Ha! You know? yeah. So it was the country director who, I went to the country director and said, look, you gotta help me on this one, right? You gotta help us on this one. So he literally started and he found this and he said, okay, we can use this to launch procurement watching support, support, yeah. What about private sector support? I mean, surely if you've got a business, you would actually want to see clarity in the yeah. procurement the, Were they on board? The challenge with that is actually we did get to the private sector till later uh -huh. in the game because we were always unsure where their sentiments lay. You know, so we wanted to be a little more uh, solid, you know, before we approached them. And that, that's the reason why we didn't do that. Uh, in the end, they did, they did come in and, and help out. You know? uh, so. So what this did was two things, you know. Uh, most important, it actually, you know, established credibility, you know, that that this this NGO really knows something about procurement, right? And so when Procurement Watch went out to engage with the other CSOs, uh, they were seen as yeah, they're credible, you know, they they understand the stuff, you know. And in fact, what the other CSOs decided to do. Yeah, let's support this process because they're going to do all the work anyway. You know, they're going to provide us. They're going to teach us all about this stuff. It's beneficial to us, so they came in. Yeah, that that was how we were able to draw the major, you know, anti-corruption CSOs into the process because you know, a lot of them really wanted to know, learn about procurement, and here was an NGO that was prepared to train and teach them about. It. Yeah? Yeah. Did you say that the procurement watch was trained by participation in the? Yeah, yeah. I mean, in terms was of discussion. That allowed, that was not like crossing the border. No, I mean, in fact, now uh, the the new law, uh, uh, the Government Procurement Policy Board has uh, two representatives: one from civil society and one from uh, and one from uh, the private sector. Yeah, it actually created it, it, was, it was, a, was a somewhat of a path-breaking thing because it, they, people never heard of this before. Uh, but but we said look we just do it and, and show that it can be done in a way that's above board that's transparent and all that and it worked. Yeah. yeah. When you established uh, PWI, did you actually have within its mandate training other CSOs? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. In fact, after the law was passed, this is very interesting because after the law was passed, <laughs> a lot of the agencies didn't call the Department of Budget and Management. They started calling Procurement Watch. <laughs> Because they had established such a reputation for knowing the nitty gritty of uh, of the law, because they were whoever involved in, in, in and they actually helped write the uh, you know the uh, implementing rules and regulations. And after like the funding from the world bank ended up because I think they yeah. didn't have they had them. Well, it was a bit of a struggle. It went to different donors. This is always the problem of of, of NGOs, particularly anti-corruption NGOs. It's always a challenge, yeah? yeah. Uh, if it's for health education, it's uh, relatively easier to find funding for that. For, for anti-corruption NGOs, it's always a struggle. So actually, uh, we have to help them, basically, uh, uh, continue to get funding, whether it was OSAID, uh, USAID, you know, uh, GIZ, you know? You just go from one, you know, to, and you just select the donors in a way such that, you know, uh, what what their interests are are more or less aligned with what you know what the procurement watch you know, was mandated to do, and the advantage of procurement watch was that at that time, because the donors saw wow this is a major breakthrough in what they were willing to kind of just put money with procurement watch because they actually helped lead the charge in. Uh, yeah. Information never associated procurement watch with 
there was a lot of uh, even I, you know, I was completely in the back room. I never showed my face in public. I refused to do any interviews. I mean, it was only very late in the game when the discussion of the legislation that I actually agreed to be interviewed. But <coughs> so procurement watch, and there, I mean, I was always engaging with the procurement watch, but people didn't really uh, see the connection with the World Bank or, or even with the government for that matter. Ed, yeah. you are operating below the waterline. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to do that. Yeah, if, you, if I were above the waterline, guess what the media would be doing? <laughs> uh, the following me, I won't be able to do anything. I think the other interesting thing is because you are international. Yeah. That's also something. Well, this is, see, the thing is, this is what the, the secretary was really quite uh, strategic, you know, because the USAID basically they want US nationals, you know, to, to be staffed in the, you know, the US national to be able to do this and all that. The secretary basically pushed back on that and said, you know, we already had a problem with this consultants that you sent, you know, I need a Filipino to do this. It can be done. You just, the, the government just has to push back. Right? And so, in fact, you know, we were the only, um, you know, group that was funded by USAID. We, it was this team was funded by USAID. You know, uh, we were the only all Filipino group funded by USAID. Everyone else was the, the imported from from the US or what? Yeah, they're doing all sorts of stuff. Yeah. How did you also stop the kind of uh, the incrustation of logos on PWI? Because obviously that. That's something that we have in Iraq. And every time anyone wants to get involved, particularly when it's something kind of successful, they want to slap their logos all over the place. No, in fact, no. In fact, uh, <laughs> with the... Well, you know, I, I, we never really uh, encountered that. that. There was a lot of interest in, 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 in let's say, we'll put money here, we'll put money there, and all that, you know. But, uh, you know, uh, PWI was always, uh, because it was homegrown, uh, and, and, and they actually knew what they were doing, right? We know, right? Mm -hmm. and, and enough of our cachet to say, look, you know, we're going to be the PWI. That's it, right? Uh, it's not PWI supported by USAID, PWI supported by USAID, it's PWI. That's it, mm -hmm. right? Unfortunately, you know, I, mean, I left, and uh, after 10 years or whatnot, you know, the organization just kind of petered off, and uh, a lot of infighting resulted, which is what happens in, the, in this organization. So. And now it's kind of a uh, dormant and you know kind of a sad ending to the, to the go this way, go that way, and eventually this whole thing. So that's this coalition was built over time. Slowly with a lot of things taking work. Yeah. Uh, and, and 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 it really is, I mean I, I literally my team was working twenty four seven, it's always PWI on this, you know. But it didn't feel like uh, like work. Because you were kind of excited about it. There was an excitement that we can beat these guys. It was that excited. Yeah. We got we to beat these guys, <laughs> that sort of thing. That was the incentive, actually. Yeah. When you tell the story, I'm struck by how much individual psychology matters. I bet, yeah. And sort of the, um, the son of a congressman or whatever mm -hmm. who had a personal yeah. motivation. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing. That's why you need to do a lot of homework in this. You have to find out what makes people think. I mean, it's just what's in it for me. Right? Yeah, and it's, that's why I want to be with them. Yeah. But, but not just good. that, it was also when you described the camaraderie in this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Full There's of people that. Yeah, but you, you, you create that. And you create that by, by getting people to work together on a problem that they, that they, that they, that they have a common, you know. Vision or shared vision on. It happens if if people believe in something, you know, and you get them working together, even if they come from so disparate places, you know, mm -hmm. after working together for some time, that group becomes very solid. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is from experience. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you have 26 people. How many people are coming to work with you? 26. 26 percent. Actually, more than 26 percent at in the floor. You know. Uh, uh, ended up voting for it. In fact, uh, all of 
all of those who voted for the bill wanted their names put as co-sponsors of the bill. Because they knew, I mean, it was already, that's why I'm going to get to the communications campaign because that's what, that was so critical in getting, getting this bill passed. Huh? Uh, because, you know, communications, this is how I look at it, you know, the media campaign. Huh? It, it was the glue. It was the glue that linked all these reformers because, you know, through the media campaign, people were engaged left, right, from different from different groups or what, and they felt like a part of the process. Mm -hmm. the, the, the communications campaign was, was was designed so that everyone could get involved, everyone could have some you know some participation in it, and, and see how in fact they could contribute. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, you started the communication campaign when you were sure that the coalition. No. Was no, we started this from the beginning. It was slowly. The communications campaign was the glue that, that that we used to actually stitch this thing, help stitch this coalition together, keep them together. Uh, okay. Now, how do I describe this? Uh, you know, the strategic communication folks are, you know, you can. I don't know what your technical term is for this, you know, but but I describe this as a combination of a public relations drive an advertising blitz and a political campaign. That's what this was all about, you know? And I tell you, uh, we had so much fun with this. And I, that's when I realized that, you know, if you're, going to, if you're going to succeed in any reform program, you absolutely need strategic communications. You cannot dispense with it. Because it's sort of like, it's sort of like your cavalry or your, your you know, your armored division, you know? You can have your TSOs and those, that's your infantry, you know? But you need artillery, you need what, and that's your artillery, right? Okay, so, so let me describe this thing, because it, that's what I learned all about. I, I literally knew nothing about communications. But, you know, I, you know, one of my team said, you know, we actually need this, and we ended up uh, teaming with a local company, yeah? And uh, what we realized, you know, because we went out to, to look at you know, possible uh, you know, uh, alternative options is you need a little li local company with, with this special skills, you know. It's not the New York advertising companies who are going to be able to do this for you. Because it's the local company that understands the culture, it understands the nuances, it understands how you're going to message, you know. And this company that we team out were so darn good. They were so darn good in the process and, and their hearts were in it, you know. Because you've got to get also, you know, the company that basically has done policy work. And at that point in time, this was only one of two that did, you know, policy reform work. Okay. So what is the, I'm hoping this works, but, uh, okay. So, you know, I kind of divided it into four quadrants. The first was radio, okay? And this is uh, AM radio, okay? Uh, now, and the target here was really the general public, right? Okay? And AM radio... The reason we talk about AM because practically everyone has an AM radio in the Philippines, you know. And we have quite a few AM radios that, that straddle that cover from north to south. So yeah. And a lot of people listen to AM radio. You know what I mean? Uh, particularly during rush hour, during the lunch hour and all that, right? And, and uh, you know, an AM radio is what a dollar, two dollars. It's very cheap. Right? Uh, so we said we needed to actually, you know, use AM radio. Uh, now, in the Philippines, AM, there are some AM radio, what do we call them, Gabby, DJs, announcers? Yes, DJ. DJs. DJs, uh -huh. who are like rock stars. <laughs> they, have, they have people who listen to them in the millions, you know, uh, during their, their, you know, their hours, right? whether it's lunch hour or rush hour, uh, early morning rush hour, late afternoon rush hour. So, so, uh, so, so essentially, you know, uh, what we did, what we had to do, there's another thing you need to do. I mean, you just don't engage media. You're gonna to have to brief media. You're gonna to have to tell them this is what this rule is, on, this this thing is all about. This is why we want to do this. This is what the benefits are going to be. This is what's going to happen if we don't do. It. Yeah, it's a lot of effort. Yeah, but the briefings here are not in boardrooms or what. You know, where will the briefings be? In bars. Yes, exactly. In bars, early morning coffee, late evening, early morning. Yeah, you know, drinking or whatnot. That's what you had to do because that was the culture, right? And that's what we had to do. We would actually be drinking wine or, not wine actually, uh, hard drinks, that's what they like. You know, whiskey was that sort of thing, or beer, yeah? And over that, we would be discussing, this is what it's all about, all that. And it, yeah. 
Did you get a Vatican radio involved? What's that? Did you get a Vatican radio? Vatican, no, I don't. Do we have Vatican radio? I yes. think we do. Yeah. But, but it's not, it's not, people don't listen to it very much, you know. No, but this, you know, the AM radio, it's really, I mean, these people are like rock stars. So where, where are the priests? Are they in the bars as well? <laughs> Some of them, I think, man. <laughs> anyway. I've had to go to church a lot. <laughs> uh, anyway, the interesting story is so, so you had this, so, so when we briefed them, so they could actually talk about this. You know? So it became sort of, that's why people learned about it, this. Procure, what is this procurement reform and all that? You know? So because of this book. You know? so, uh, so that's kind of the swath part of it. But there's also the dagger part of it because you can use. We use them very strategically as well, right? Um, and I'll just—I like telling this story because this, this is the one that's most 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 interesting and actually, you know, uh, you know, uh, in a way funny, you know. Uh, uh, during the uh, appropriations committee debates, right? Uh, there was a, a congressman in the in the committee who was a bit of a of a pain in the butt, you know. Was creating problems, and, and you know, if they can't agree on this, you can't, you can't send it to the floor. You know, a bill needs to pass the committee for it to get to the floor, and this guy was just kind of delaying stuff and all sort of stuff. And so, uh, uh, one of our so our, our, our communications team said, okay, let's uh, let's ask uh, our uh, our AM folks uh, for some help, advice on how we might address this. Yeah? So I kind of met with some of them. Now one of them said. I'll take care of it. <laughs> yeah, I'll take care of it. Yeah, I said okay. Right. So yeah. So what he does is, you know, he has a uh, he has a lunch hour thing. You know, he he calls up this congressman in <laughs> lunch hour. Right. In congressman, they love to go on radio. Right. It's free advertising. Right? And so congressman answers it. Besides, if he doesn't answer it, I mean, you know, it's kind of a bad signal, right? So he's almost by default he has to answer it. So he answers it, and this because this this D, DJ basically we briefed him, he understood the stuff. He was able to actually get what I call guiding questions, right? <laughs> that sort of thing. Yeah, in the process, um, and and after about five minutes of kind of discussion on the phone, he said, "Well, you know, uh, Mr. Congressman, you know, all these problems that we talked about, you know." Actually, it can be resolved by this bill in your committee right now. You know, well, what's happening to it and all that. And the guy, of course, had to start, you know, blah blah blah, and all that, and that sort of thing. You know, uh, well, needless to say, that that really helped push this thing mm -hmm. out you know, onto the floor. Because if this guy continued to do it, you can bet your life this guy's going to call again, and and he just be labeled as some kind of whatever. Right? So that that's why I meant by dagger, very strategic use. Now, I don't know if you can do this in other countries, but certainly in the context of the Philippines, it's a very powerful instrument. Mm -hmm. right? Okay, the next thing is, okay, uh, we gotta get the sort of the influential folks, the middle class engaged in this. Right? And there was a lot of, uh, you know, uh, what we did was we, we got, you know, people from civil society, government, from the private sector, on uh, uh, TV talk shows. That sort of thing. There's a lot of that, you know. And uh, uh, one of the highlights of this is uh, the biggest cable channel actually uh, uh, decided to do a documentary mm -hmm. on the whole process of the bill. And if this works, I can show you snippets of it. Ah, it works. <laughs> Maraming nag-iiro sa eh, mga Pilipino dahil lang dyan sa mga kapag-gerno, yung mga nangyayang-nangyayang na kalakad-kalakad. Maraming lahat. There can never be a pure, good government. You gotta learn how to make a balance between the good and the bad. Ulaan mo mga... This is a taxi driver. And what he's talking about is really corruption actually deters foreign investment. This is a taxi driver. Yeah? So he understands it. He understands the connection. Huh? 
This was the U.S. ambassador, who was actually very supportive of the process. Is it Ricardo? Yeah, Mr. Tony. Yeah, he's a great guy. He'll fight battles, actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is this is what you know, and this got played several times, right? And then the target audience here was basically middle class. You know? uh, so the next was print media. Okay. And here, you know, uh, in, uh, here the the this was where we kind of you know made it worthwhile for the politicians to be engaged. You know? uh, one of the things we did, for instance, was we uh, we we had to uh, we had to reach out to uh, you know so-called uh, government budget people. You know, besides the procurement folks, the budget people, <coughs> both current and retired, right? Because they they would be good spokespersons for this. You know, and uh, again, so, by, by by luck, it was serendipitous. You know, they they actually. Had already had an association, long-standing association, this Philippine Association of Government Budget Analysts, and they paid annual fees, you know, just like uh, you know, um, you know, a, a retired person or whatever, ERP or what. They had regular fees, and they had programs, quarterly programs. Yeah, you know? every quarter they had a conference somewhere in the country, three days, and uh, at least one one of those days is devoted to learning something new. Right? So we decided, would you be willing to actually engage with us and we'll spend the time explaining what this procurement reform is all about. And you know, the, the, the board of the association, some of them were already in technical working group, they said, let's do that. Let's, let's try and you know, convince the rest of the board. So, so that's what happened, you know? And we did this over a period of two years. Right? Every quarter, you know, do this, right? Uh, and this, you know, a large number of folks. You know, they're about you know six to ten thousand strong, right? Uh, but the thing is, those events gave us an excuse to call the media. Mm -hmm. Come on in, guys. There's something being talked to here, right? And in each of those events, we either had one, we had one of the champions there being the keynote speaker, right? And of course, his face and his whatever is all splattered all over the papers and all that. And so that, that, that meant high profile stuff. And we did that all the time, you know? I mean, this is just one of the ways in which we used the media to help, not just spread the word, but to use it strategically so that this politicians actually get some benefit from this process, you know? Because in the end, that's what mattered to them. I want to get reelected, you know? So I want to be associated with the bill and make sure that in fact, you know, I am associated with, I am the key person, right? So that's, that's what we did on that. And then finally, we actually ran an advertising campaign. It's literally an advertising campaign. You know, we had, I, I, I don't bring it with me anymore. I used to have all this stuff, you know. We, used, we, had, we had stickers, you know, small stickers that we gave to, uh, to uh, taxi drivers and they would put in the back, you know. What did uh, it say? Uh, it, had, it had something like, uh, you know, procurement reform, you know, and then something about corruption. All we needed to do, all we wanted to do was associate procurement reform with anti-corruption. So people would know this was something about fighting corruption. That's all you can do, really. Yeah? And that's what this, this advertising campaign you know, was all about. Yeah? Uh, uh, of course, in the back, of some, the back of some of these materials, we, we had the basic elements of the law and all that for people who would be interested. But we never thought of that people would go to that extent. It's just being able to understand the links, right? So we had big banners, which we gave to private industry. And then they would, in their buildings, they would have it in front, you know, in front of the buildings, things like that, right? Uh, now, the most innovative thing then that we actually did, what the, the communications team did, was this, you know. Uh, see, that was kind of our, what do you call it? Brand slogan. Uh, so, slogan or motto or whatever. It's sort of like the Nike, whatever, this thing. You know? So that people would associate, oh, that's procurement reform. So just a fire, people already know it's procurement reform. It's about production, right? And uh, one of the younger members of the communications team came up with this idea. Guess what this was?
say no. Uh, very cheap to produce. And what they did was, they did this, gave it to the members of the appropriations committee, had them give it to the committee members and the other staff in the house, the same thing in the Senate, and to whatever friends or what, you know, and put this on your computer. Right? You get this going, <laughs> if you get this going, you get this going in the house, you know, it, it gives you a sense that eh, there's really something happening. Right? So, uh, this was part of uh, the advertising and the campaign. Alright? So, this money was given by the government? Uh, no, they, uh, there was a grant from a USAID. Yeah. Well, it was the government that basically got the grant. Yeah. Uh, um, and so, uh, uh, as a, as a, as a basically a conclusion to this, um, one of the one of the main features of the bill, eventually as it was passed, was it, it opened up the doors for civil society organizations to be legally engaged, you know, mm -hmm. you know, in the monitoring of uh, procurement in the Philippines, and that really opened up uh, the, uh, the 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 whole policy process and, you know, to CSOs. I mean, from then on, you know, the CSOs were being invited to be engaged in other sorts of, you know, monitoring and all that. You know, so in a way, this was one of the impacts of the law. And, and uh, this is, uh, you know, I think two years ago, uh, Transparency and Accountability Network, that was the main accountability network, which Procurement Watch eventually became a part of that. Uh, this is Vince Lesetine, who was then, I think he still is the executive director for that. The one on the right is the former country director of the Philippines, you know. The bank actually gave uh, you know, one million dollar. Country director of Phil uh, for the Philippines, World Bank. World Bank. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, then there was a, a grant to you know, the Transparency and Accountability Network to be able to, yeah, yeah. Um, what would you do different now if you if you were to start all over again without the benefit of hindsight? What what would you do different? Uh, there was an initial phase which I didn't talk about, uh, which kind of, it, it fell flat, you know? Because we made quite a few mistakes, and one of the biggest mistakes was we kind of just followed the advice of the, the, the political folks, the political representative of the Department of Budget Management in, in the legislature to do it quietly. Mm -hmm. That was the first one, that fell flat, you know? And we lost about a year and a half. In that process. So, so you would basically do a lot of noise and. Yeah, he, they don't just didn't want to, you know, just do it quietly. We'll just slip it in. We'll just that sort of thing, you know, and that that didn't work out, you know. That's why we call that that was round one. So round one we lost. I, what I what I've talked, talked about is round two. Okay. So we wouldn't have done that very clear. Yes, sir. Bro. And you say that you didn't have a, a stakeholder uh, mapping tool no. at that time, but in, in the end you, you actually yeah. invented the tool. Yeah. But assume that you had that tool at that uh, time, yeah. how much time would you, would, would you have saved by having a lot. that tool? A lot. If we had, because we, we, we have a stakeholder influence mapping tool now, right? And it, it really helps unravel who are the real players and how are they linked and how much influence they have, you know? With that tool, you know, we would have been able to identify, we do this first, and that, that first, and that uh, Instead of the hit or miss experiment and that sort of thing. We would have saved quite a bit of time. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of magical chemistry did you use to bring together the government and the civil society <laughs> organizations? Because <laughs> normally they, they are not really very friendly. It's, I wouldn't call it magical chemistry, actually it's trust. That's what um, yeah, you have to earn it. How do you bring them together? Because in some countries they are really okay. Yeah, which is why PWI was created. PWI was is a civil society organization, right? And civil society provided that that wow. credibility link. Right? So they became convenient. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of it revolved around for the procurement watch without people really realizing it. They were the ones that were actually moving the stuff. Yes. But also, you've, met, you've talked about serendipity a lot, but I don't see it that way. I see, from the way you describe it, you have looked at every single interaction as a strategic interaction. Yeah, yeah. So the fact that somebody's brother 
with this person, right. instead of saying, oh yeah, whatever, he's a brother. It's okay, right, how can we use that asset? How can yeah, we work exactly. that? Yeah, yeah. And that, that's not serendipitous, that's well, <laughs> It's strategic. I mean, I mean, another way of putting it is that you have to think strategically, right? Yeah, sure. And you have to take what is given your way, right? And use it in whatever uh, as effective way as you can. You know? Yes. Yeah. Uh, this was 2002? No, 1998 to 2001. Okay. Yeah. Um, when you look at uh, the country now, do you at least you know, the impact of this reform? Yeah. Actually, it's interesting because uh, I, I know yeah, uh, we always knew that the first part of this reform process would be the relatively the easiest. The harder would be the implementation, right? It's now been ongoing. Kabi will be talking about that. And what we're seeing is that, you know, there's, there's progress being made little by little, you know, in, in different slices, you know. We've certainly made tremendous progress in the education sector, you know, on, on, on textbooks, school supplies, desks, and all that, you know. We're starting to make inroads in the, uh, in what you call the, uh, the medical, you know, the, the, the procurement of drugs. Uh, and I understand now, you know, even on roads, you know, finally we have a secretary that's willing, okay, we have a law, let's really take it to heart, right? So what this did was actually it created basically the possibilities for someone who was really interested in doing something to be able to get something done because the law was already there, right? I have an impression that from the way you say that the United States that they was ready to use the law. Uh, I have an impression that there are no single creative actions. That is why, for example, they have people who are discretionary in the case that I don't want to use this law or something like that. Because if the law is very functioning mm -hmm. and your costs are going over, yeah. nobody has the legacy to say, I'm going to use it when it comes to issues of potential. Well, no, I mean, what, what I mean by this is that, you know, I mean, to really push it very hard, you know, because, like, for instance, in public works, you know, uh, the, the real challenge was uh, getting it sort of uh, mainstream into the rural areas, right? And, and, and for a long, long time, you know, the focus was in the large urban areas because that was the easier thing to do, right? And they had to focus on that, and I think that one has more or less been managed, right? But now, you know, it needed another secretary uh, or a secretary to say, all right, time to actually start working on, you know, on those guys in the rural areas. You can't do this all overnight. You've got to be very strategic. You've got to hit those where you feel you have, you know, an opening, and you do that, you know. You succeed there, then you move on. I say this because say, if you look at Ghana mm -hmm. in particular, you have a situation where we have a public procurement act yeah. that governs on procurement yeah. activities. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, for every ministry or department, you have a procurement plan that you have. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you have a situation where, for no where a particular service or groups are needed. Mm -hmm. And it is a strategy by whoever intends benefiting from that. It creates just like what uh, some of the services are doing. Create an emergency situation where you need to. Yeah, yeah. And mostly the easiest way to go back is to source. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have a situation where, yes, the law is there, but they find a way of going around it. I don't know whether in, in, in the experience. Philippines it's very hard to do some sourcing. No. Before it was easy. You, know, you have to go through a lot of hopes to justify some source. And, and, and the, the, the thing, the, the people, so you just basically give it to, hand it out to whoever you, you think, you know, one, 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 one bidder, one contractor. It's almost like you can bring the right thing, you know. Um, so uh, you just can't do that anymore now in the Philippines, right? Um, uh, and, and, and the other thing too is, you know, um, uh, see when people, civil society, the public, the private sector, understand better what the process is all about, it's much harder to start reading this stuff because people start questioning. The smaller ones, they might be able to get away with it. But I guarantee you, the big ones, you're not going to get away with it. You know, like our big infrastructure projects, you know, it's the national uh, movement uh, for free elections, the whole group that actually monitors those, the procurement of those. So you can't do any funny business in there because that, that's a group. They're very good, you know, but off. Off elections, they're not doing anything, and so they've got all this you know, troops. They participate in those big. So, so the thing again, you know, you have to be strategic about it. You can't do everything, right? What is it that you can target? And right? so, so, so they decided we will do the big ones. Right? Um, we didn't talk about the, the mechanization of the opponents of reforms. 
How did they try to block you? <laughs> uh, you know, one of the things that uh, happened was, uh, you know, in the beginning we thought that this was all uh, all the contractors, you know, uh, were actually, you know, part of this vested interest, you know, uh, and we realized towards towards the middle part that in fact the urban contractors weren't quite aligned with the rural contractors. So what we did was we, uh, you know, it was all divide and conquer kind of thing, you know. And, you know, we did this in a way that the rural congressmen in the, in the, in the, in the rural uh, uh, the public works officers, the, you know, that whole cadre, the triads that we call them, you know, uh, wouldn't really see this, you know, uh, as a big wave coming, right? It, it, because it was built up very gradually. It was built up very gradually. Now, by the time, you know, it became sort of a very, you know, kind of a, a, a big thing, you know, it was a little too late for them to actually get, you know, on board on this one because we already had created a whole army, literally, that could contest them. You see, I, I, I did put the picture here, you know, I mean, you know, I, we did a retrospective net map of, of this, actually. And before this reform, you know, the key players were just three, you know, I mean, basically these rural congressmen, the rural contractors, and those public works, whatever, or, or the education, rural officers, that sort of thing, right? And, the, and for about 20 years, they just they controlled this process. They were on the negative side. Yeah, they were on the negative <laughs> side, right? And then there were a lot of potential groups, stakeholders, that would have wanted to see this, you know, stop, you know, and change the whole thing. But it was completely uh, unorganized. And so, you know, no one was doing anything because these folks were unorganized, right? What we did was we actually organized them, you know? And when you organize all of these folks, all of a sudden, you, you look at the map, you have this whole caboodle, a big army against these folks, you know? Uh, including, you know, parts of the media. Again, it becomes a little difficult for the best of the interest to start contesting you when you have that, right? So that's why I'm saying it's like fighting a war. You have to kind of bring your forces together. The vested interests, they're small, they're narrow, right? And the only reason they control it is because they're well organized and they have, uh, they have information advantage, right? Once you actually hit them on that, you know, you can begin to un unshackle their, uh, their, uh, uh, you know, their, yeah. Uh, what was the duration for your media campaign was it uh, continuous or continuous? No, no, it's continuous. Well, right, but yeah, you know. Now, you know, one of the things we did was because there were always this procurement, scandals or whatnot, any time there was a procurement scandal, we wrote on it. Oh. You would just write on it. And we, that, that's why you need a communications team so that they can move quickly. Something, we had a fire truck scandal, you know. There was a, wow, boom, the, the team just read what it is. Just, 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 just blow it up, you know. I mean, uh, this is why you know, I, I'm a great believer in strategic communication because you can. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's right. You said that you are area in the area sites. Do you think that you guys have to identify the problems with the area? Yeah. One thing is that the other one is it. Exactly. Yeah. And how do you do that? Yeah, it was through this uh, process, right? You know, we, we did this workshop. We wanted to see, you know, who, who among the experts would come and who among the experts would eventually stay. Uh, the lesson there is you need a mechanism to kind of draw out, you know, those reformers. They are there. You don't know them. But you have to somehow figure out how to draw them out. The impression I'm getting is that this aspect that you brought to where, like, the secretaries and others were talking about. Yeah. 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 Uh, the main players were supportive of the effort. Secretary of Finance came from the private sector and understood what, what this problem was. And because he himself was in a big corporation, they had procurement problems as well. Um, you know, it's, you know, 
the thing is, you know, politics makes strange bedfellows, as they say, right? You know, uh, in uh, in the Senate, for instance, you know, uh, our main sponsor there, our main super champion, was a guy who was known to be incredibly corrupt in the past. You know? But he, we, we knew he was the guy who could bring this bipartisan effort in there. And we also realized he was aging, you know, that he wanted the kind of, yeah, fair image. So you work with that guy, you work with people like that. You know, and, you know this, this things, I can't tell you, you know, what you're gonna come across, but what I can tell you is that, you know, you just need to have slowly increasing number of people involved in this process, you know, so that you can really fight this battle. And you be strategic at how you, Approach it. You can't be sort of the all moralistic kind of study. Yeah, yeah, we'll just talk about it quickly. Yeah. Um, you say that you, a lot of your work is done through PWI, so kind of the World Bank profile was kept quite low. But I never worked with the World Bank, but certainly with the UN, communications is always a kind of bolt on. It's the press release at the end. It's, yeah. um, you know, <laughs> So how did you manage to take this example and say, look, strategic communications is essential to any of the work, every, every single initiative that we do. So can we please have a bigger budget and more focus and kind of... <laughs> That's why we have this program. Thank you, Jackie. That's why we have this That's program. What, to do. See, uh, what we're trying to do, uh, certainly one of the objectives here is to get people like our friends from the, uh, from the, uh, from the regions, from the country offices, to actually, you know, uh, you know, come to this uh, program and be able to help our own leadership programs in the field. So are you going to start getting new involved? Was this? What about getting new NDP involved? And we could, yes, we <laughs> could. I mean, uh, you know, this is why we, we partnered with uh, the Annenbergs, because right. we wanted uh, to actually create this network of, of strategic communication experts who could provide their expertise to reforms. Not to the private sector yeah. kinds of stuff where normally their, their, their skills are, are put to use. It's to, to issues like this. Because it's so badly needed. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, that's why this course was mm -hmm. part of the reason. Yeah. Okay. How did you uh, sort of measure success? And if it's still going on, apparently yeah. Yeah. it's still going on, yeah. is there an institutional body who does it? Like, uh, I don't know. Well, I, I don't know if the Government Procurement Policy Board actually does assessments or what, you know? Uh, certainly, the passage of the law to us, it's, you know, we had intermediate milestones, right? Mm -hmm. Let's get executive orders done first, you know, and then, uh, you know, let's get this document uh, uh, of support from, you know, from the church, from it's, uh, all these intermediate things, you know. And then finally, you know, let's get the law passed. Right. You know? and th those are our indicators, right? Now, in, in terms of the implementation of this, one of the, one of the rough indicators we use is, is uh, you know, at least, in, you know, uh, the first 10 years, you know, uh, is uh, a World Bank instrument which is called the uh, uh, Procurement yeah, Assessment Review. We can talk yeah. about it more in the implementation yeah. phase, yeah. but that's a very yeah. good question. We should yeah. hang on yeah. to that. Right. Okay. So, so it's other people doing it, you know? In the most uh, monitoring information system, um, I will think that in the same direction, because uh, yeah. to evaluate, uh, to see yeah. the results, we have to uh, the system is key. That's right. Yeah. Now, for goods and supplies, it's a little easier now because, uh, as a part of this uh, reform, uh, th they set up, uh, uh, you know, an E. Uh, at least the, the, the one pillar of an E procurement system, all, all ads and all that, and all contracts, awarded contracts, need to be posted, and reasons for the posting for, for the awards. Right? So it's much more transparent, and so you can get that information. From, from, from much more easily now. Yes, sir. Yeah, you said that the Okamin group was dormant, not allowed to investigate. Yeah. Why was it dormant? Was it not established by law? It was established by law. Well, you know, <laughs> uh, Marcos was an incredibly corrupt guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so eventually, you know, he created this as part of what we call the these new society initiatives. The first four years, I can tell you, the first four years of President Marcos uh, were probably the best in terms of economic growth. So he, he was on the right track the first four years, and then that kind of went, went by the wayside, and with that, uh, uh, the institutions that were put in place to actually help to stimulate that growth. Mm -hmm. One comes to the government procurement policy board, but you know, they didn't have to kind of uh, issue, they didn't have to get the Congress to say, you know, close it. They so just let it kind of slide, then, you know, and, and it becomes dormant. Uh, yeah. 
we have been learning that strategic communication with the wrong people. And we are seeing that how much you are involved personally, individually in this whole exercise. Yeah. Knowing very well that the world might have died of this only, so you have to go on a leave and yeah. take on this plan. At the end of course the world bank came back and lied on a success. Yeah. <laughs> so from that, going through all these hurdles and difficulties, what kind of uh, advice would you give to this group? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I just think, you know, uh, uh, you just got to persevere, I think. got to play the game. Play the round game. game. I mean, I went with this, into this book, my name was I school, really open. You know, you're going to play ball with politicians who will want to play fun games, you know, you've got to be able to play that game in a way that doesn't, you know, really just compromise you. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and which is why, you know, I, I, you know it, it's, it was that experience really that I you know, come to this belief that there, there are always kind of good people in government who are willing to help, and we just need to find them. And I, I must say, you know, these people, the members of the technical working group, you know, you know, you know, even the people in the upper operations committee, I still, I don't know, I still kind of, when I see them, we still reminisce about those days. Those were good days. Yeah. But a good movie, I think. Why? <laughs> I don't know about that. You know. But also, if you're corrupt, there's always someone out to get you that you can then leverage to get that other person out of the way. Well, I mean, we did quite a, a little, quite a bit of it, because that's why it's useful to see who's connected to what, who's linked to what. Or maybe this guy, or we know the cousin of this guy, or whatever, and let's, let's use that. Yeah. Now, that's why this, this tool, this net map tool, is really useful. Yeah, because you, you can actually replicate it over and over again as, as the process uh, progresses. So, okay, things are things, things are shifting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. That's a uh, very like, detailed uh, question. Um, who contacted the information? It was a combination of PWI and RT. Mm -hmm. So, and, uh, and then, of course, the Department of Budget Management weighed in. The, the, the advantage of having been based in the Department of Budget Management is that they handle the budget, so politicians listen when they call. You know, just <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at the transition of this storyline from um, the very first part that is with the executive uh, will, the political will yeah. part of it, as it transits over to the point where there's an opt uptake in the public will, yeah. and and then beyond, I don't know what the end game is. And so, it's it's clear, I mean, one of the things that I've drawn from this is that you really have to, well, first of all, you don't have to be too uh, um, moralistic about where that political will is coming from in the first instance. And it's ironic that they're starting to pound up, you know, being charged for corruption. But to what extent is that typically the uh, the framing of, of, of this kind of engagement? I mean, I I, I, I was tangentially involved with uh, reforms in some of the sectors in Nigeria in 2003 on the, when it was the first came. Yeah. And was also part of the civil society group responsible for setting up uh, NEITI. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Uh, with the public to pay condition, and then Shino would say it was all below, below the water line. And so it's interesting to see how it's just, you know, of course, no attribution. But there was a case of manifest political will. There was a, and, and typically, it happens in an environment where there's a political price to pay mm -hmm. for not saying that you want to change, because yeah. you, you get to that point. But beyond that, it can just either be A, a pronouncement, mm -hmm. or B, a sense of the government actually, you know, meaningly, I mean, meaningfully, you know, diving into it, and it, it, you're never quite sure because politicians are, you know, at one time, you know, they're interested, and also they, they've gone on to something else, but they've unleashed this thing, and it, you can't put the genie back in the bottle to, to be sure. But the question now becomes the tipping point for the public, and that's where the work is. How do you get it to the point where <laughs> that's why it tips into the don't you, I can, uh, don't you, that's why it was important you know, it was essentially our team and PWI mm. that really made this thing just push, mm. push. 
there has to be that core group that constantly mm -hmm. pushing. And my team, is, uh, team included some people from the Department of Budget Management. Just constantly pushing. There has to be that engine. There has to be an engine that's pushing this process. And uh, believe me, politicians are so busy and all that, you know. So, you know, they, they can't focus on this all the time, right? So if you've got this engine that's moving, 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 you know. Uh, okay, okay, we'll do that, the politician, you know. Uh, the politicians who want to help will just help, you know. You, uh, you can't expect them to lead the charge on this. They're just not going to do it. You know? But if you have an engine that's moving this pro forward, you know, you have a good chance of actually getting to where you want to go. The other, sorry, the other uh, no. another question is, the formulation of that engine, that's your well oiled yeah. machine. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, just the logistics of getting such a team. I mean, you are not saying that uh, you had a executive uh, clause and the, 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 president was, the president was willing to put out somewhere to start it. Yeah. But to sustain it, you, you know, you're, you're confronted with just <laughs> light it's hard. Yeah. Right? And yeah. it took you four years. Yeah. Yeah. How do you get funding for four years? to keep a team going, right, that is somewhat insulated from financial vagaries of just survival in that space, but yeah. still focused on it. Uh, so it's very, very, you know. It's tough. It's tough. It's, and, uh, and, you know, uh, I think Serendipity actually has a very hard to play that. But the one thing we discovered, though, is if you're working on this sorts of issues, if you approach, let's say, the private sector, they're always willing to help in, in some way. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you know, for all this communication stuff, advertising, you know, you needed to use private sector folks, you know. You got huge discounts. Mm -hmm. Huge discounts on radio, huge discounts mm -hmm. on TV, because you know, they see that it's a worthy cost. So the, instead of charging you 100,000, okay, you know, we'll give them 30,000. Mm -hmm. So you get this, this push, you know. And then, you know, one fortunate thing is, you know, USAID had a, had a big budget then for anti-corruption work. And, and they, see, once they see, oh, that train is moving, yeah. let's put the money in there. See, that's what happens. But on your, on the, the danger there is, you, know, you, you need to be able to, to make sure that the money that comes, you know, is not with all the other strings attached. Yeah. 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 But also with that, I mean, Iraq is a classic example of people coming in, well, I'd say with good intentions, okay, with intentions that they they would like to have perceived to be good <coughs> and a lot of money. Because then you've got NGOs that were simply swamped <coughs> with yeah. hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars. And they've now just become um, pork barrel lobby machines. Yeah. Um, mm. And every every politician in Iraq has an NGO as, long, as well as a telecoms company, etc. Um, and actually trying to work with that. You know, I, what I've found is that the people who I can work with on, let's say, elections, um, are not the typical uh, elections monitoring organizations that, you know, because they speak English and push a woman in front, generally yeah. tend to get a lot of money. But it's actually young people who are online at the moment. Mm -hmm. That's a really mm -hmm. big issue. So for you, you, you have the, the screensaver. Yeah. How did you actually get the youth involved in other ways? But you didn't have social media. Oh, yes. so the youth was very much involved in you? this. In fact, I didn't. Uh, it's a good thing you remember me. I made this. Uh, Remember, we engaged this uh, Walanco Corrupt uh, Youth Movement. Yeah, these are actually uh, an organization of student councils from different universities. You know, ranging from really right wing to left wing. I mean, they're just all in this, right? Uh, and you know, they, they all kind of believed in the cause. Yeah, we, we need to do this, and they're very idealistic and all that. And if you actually ask them to organize something, they will organize something because they they're good at this, right? And they're they're. Their heart is really in it, and they'll call the students in. You know, so we went to different universities, you know, talking about this, which is how the students got got informed about this. You know, um, and, and you know, the, the, the one thing that, that that I can really clearly remember, which which is really quite, uh, you know, it was very heartwarming. You know, uh, in the debates, the final debates and discussion of the appropriations committee on the bill, you know, we, we knew we needed to get that out already. Right now, this uh, this committee discussions are, are open to the public, right? So we asked this this grouping, can you come and attend this? You know, they actually came in, you know, in huge numbers, and, and their officers, you know, they 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 had the, you know what we did was we said okay we can have T-shirts, are you willing to wear this? They bore it, 
all this you know, procurement reform, that sort of thing. And they actually, they, you know, say this was the committee, whatever, uh, it was a meeting. They were in the chairs here, and they were sitting down, and they were actually, you know, sort of you know, showing that we cared about this, you know. And I think that made a lot of difference, you know, in, in the discussions, because it was interesting. After the discussions, there was, you know, okay, we're back to bill, we're going to put it on the floor, a lot of clapping. A lot of the congressmen started hanging around with the, with the, with the students, wanting to get pictures with the students. And I mean, so I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, it was, uh, I learned so much in this process, you know, I mean, and, and, and part of it is that, you know, uh, there, there's, good in, there's good in many people. You, know, you just have to kind of tap that and see how you can actually, you know, uh, uh, bring it into, you know, uh, into the process. Excuse me. Uh, in terms of your communication, uh, one of the things I realized you never mentioned had to do with, uh, I'm not too sure how the system is going to be in the film, so how are the opposition parties. The reason being that in most countries, for example, you know, the way you have partisan agreements when it comes to issues of reforms and other things. Um, I'm not too sure with this. Obviously, the success of this reform is going to be a credit to the Indian government. Yeah. And therefore, Opposing parties will want to see how they can mess it up. So the question then is, in your communication, how do you factor all this together? Well, uh, remember I mentioned in the beginning, party it doesn't matter. It you know what I mean? It's not a, parties don't really have money in the Philippines. Individuals fund their own campaigns. It's not, I mean, the parties have a little money, but they, they're not like parties in other countries which are well funded and basically, you know, they, they, they've heard their, 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 you know, Members, right? In the Philippines, it's each one to his own. And that is a simple question. Well, a lot. Right. <laughs> but you know, at the same time, you know, you if you're going to fight the battle, it's also to your advantage because if you can organize, you know, they're not as well organized. Uh, they don't have a party to back them up. <laughs> hey, one quick that? point from me, Ed, if what? you don't mind. It's um, just to make an in in interjection about. Uh, the, the real importance of two things, the understanding the post environment really well. Yeah. Uh, I got to meet um, the, the head of the firm that um, Ed used. What's Ray the name? Ray, Ray DeVitt. Mm -hmm. uh, brilliant. In fact, uh, a member of his team came to the first, uh, the first time we did this. this course, yeah. I mean, you should have met that guy. Yeah. The political astuteness, it was the outstanding student of our first cohort. Mm -hmm. I mean, the political, this Frilaria case you're working on, mm -hmm. you should have listened to him when he was given the presentation of his group on the final day of the tactics and maneuvers that you needed to make. Right. It was amazing. Yeah. I mean, these are people who really know how to fight in the trenches of politics. So that's a team that Ed's, Ed, Ed, that work with Ed. Right. And, and that's what I, I, I'm saying to you guys. It's about really brilliant tactical maneuvering. And that team is very good. And then the second thing is what the French call is it bricolage? Mm -hmm. Bricolage. Bricolage. That a lot of this is making do with what's available mm -hmm. yeah. as you go along. It, it's yeah. not going to be about a fine, elegant process. <laughs> oh, it's we have this from all. Oh, yeah. Suddenly we find that we can get some money from USAID. But if not USAID, maybe Ossid has a bit of money in one pot. Who would grab that? You just put it together and keep the thing going. It's brick or Yeah. Which is why you need, you know, you really yeah. need that you know, machine to be able to yeah. manage this whole process. There's a lot of unpredictability and uncertain turns and yeah. all that, and you need to be able to deal with it as, as, as yeah. they come. Mm -hmm. yeah. The team you're talking about that is driving this constantly, yeah. how, how many people were there? The, the, in, 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 in my own uh, team, we were the technical support group to the technical working group. Uh, there's four of us. And then, of the technical working group, there was probably four people there who were from the government who were really, really involved, you know, day to day kinds of stuff. That was it. That was it. And then PWI. That was it. But the thing is, constant. And the communication team. Constant, constant meeting, constant discussion, constant work. You know? um, we, uh, you know, by, by the time, you know, the, the, the second year towards the third year, what, we were meeting the, the communications team every Friday evening to review what happened during the week and to kind of discuss what might happen in the following week and what strategies we needed to. 
It was, that's why I say it's like fighting a war. It's almost like, in fact, the joke was there, there's a hotel that we, we kind of met, you know, in, in, in Manila. That was our war room. We would meet there every Friday night. In the end. But it was also a great move to get the election monitoring organization yeah. involved because then what you also do as, a, as an add on, if you say, it, 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 kind of a, a force multiplier, if you like, is that then you get elections no longer being seen as events, but actually as part of the whole yeah, yeah. process of accountability, which is what is not happening in its own Yes, Rula. Yeah, this conversation really shows how ill, Ill prepared we are in our organization to do, to do this type of work. Our understanding of development is really based on the ana analytics. Yeah. Uh, getting the analytics right, hoping that some miracle will, will happen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we, we don't have any other skills that are you know political operative or, or communication exactly. operative. Yeah. And so we don't have those skills. Yeah. Now, of course, you can grab them, but you need an understanding of what are the pieces you need to grab in yeah. order to, to, yeah. to make the, the process so, move forward. Yeah. So we are really so far from Absolutely. that, and that's why we are. It's an up appeal back uh, I think some other organizations are behind you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, you see, you know, everything is relative. Also, you have been a Filipino minor as a lot. If you are coming as a foreigner, you may not have been able to do it. Well, I can tell you, this kind of work needs to be done by local. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You will not get into first base with, uh, with Absolutely. Uh, a foreigner doing it. It's got to be local. You won't understand the norms, you won't understand anything. But at least you have to build in your operations the right components. Oh, yeah. There is space to do that. Space to do it, and uh, you know, uh, you actually, like our leadership program, it, it, its its objective is to, to, to help build the skills of locals in doing this kind of stuff. Right. This program is a complement to that. The stuff that you're learning here are skills that you actually need for the kinds of things that we were doing. Them, right, and unfortunately, you don't you don't learn this too much in universities or in you know whatever it is. You know, you've you've got to somehow search this out, and and then in the end, you actually need to get engaged and really just uh, learn the stuff as it, as it moves along. Right? It's like driving a car; you can just yeah. learn so only so much in the. Uh, you have to actually drive it, maybe uh, yeah. you know uh, have a couple of bumps here and there, and realize. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, in yeah. saying that, our president, uh, our new president, um, has started this huge campaign against corruption. But now that I see what you did in Philippines, who they have really benefited in having a strategy with a different government, yeah. because what he did was just focus on the losing party. So uh, it was like a, a chess or societ. No, <laughs> and, losing strategy. And, yeah. and that's all he did. How do you say it? Which, yeah, which, 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 and that's, and he ended up uh, putting in jail the son of our old president. Mm. He got some support from, from, from the population, but if he had this type of strategy, it would have been, yeah. you know, longer so, staying yeah. and mm -hmm. more successful. A bipartisan, multi-partisan yeah. is it just so much old better old. than yeah. this. Yeah. Old party. I mean, because you know, when that party comes into power, they're going to do exactly the same thing. They're going to say, "Why you know? yeah. This is essentially what's happening in Bangladesh. You know, yeah. Bangladesh is just that. that you know? Absolutely. But this is new in Senegal because we've never had anybody put in jail for yeah. someone in the in the government for stealing, and this is the very first time. Mm -hmm. Even though, like. Four or five years ago, we knew that but nobody went to jail. People just said they have, you know, they stole this much money. But for the first time, someone actually went to jail for stealing money, and it was the son of the ex president. Mm -hmm. It sent a powerful message that, you know, our new president is very determined to stop corruption, but still, he didn't uh, build on that momentum. Yeah. But I say prosecuting his own members, members of his own party. Yeah. And he, he was actually part of that government. But he came and said, I was part of that group, I know how they did it, and I want that to stop. Mm -hmm. So he really detached himself from, from that all. And he was a prime minister. Yeah. Oh. He detached himself, and you know he got some support. Well, you know, mm -hmm. you know, who knows? He could still maneuver through this. You know, I mean, yeah. I mean, he needs to start focusing. Because you know, if you're not just going to do prosecution, you're not going to get very good. You've got to fix the systems. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> How did you come to, to, to focus on procurement uh, with your 
laser beam instead of other sectors uh, um, which were, I guess, also corrupt? Well, there were two areas which were really, you know, you know the most corrupt. Actually. It was procurement and tax administration. We actually did both, right? Uh, we failed miserably in the tax administration. There was a lot of lessons to be learned from that. Because, you know, the kind of the, first of all, we were brought in middle of the game in the tax administration reform. Then it started it on a different footing. And then they were making a headway there. We were asked to come in to help, but it was, it was a little too late, I mean, when we came in. You know? uh, but those are the only two things, basically, that uh, we decided to focus on. You can't do everything. You just have to make a decision what you're going to do. You know? I think that that's a very important point, that you really have to target yeah. something. Yeah. Um, because like in Iraq, people look at corruption and they just see a big soup. It's like, you know, yeah. where do you begin? And all the, all the initiatives that have started have gone in that way. So, right, we're going to stop corruption. It's like, okay. Because that every politician will shout at somebody and say, either you're Sunni and you're corrupt, or you're Shia and you're corrupt. It's part and parcel of the whole sectarianism. Yeah. And so it just becomes one of the, the counters that people are moving around. And the international community has basically given up because they, every time they try, they become part of the problem as well. Yeah. Um, because instead of being used, you know, internationals have a really important role to play in the sense yeah. that they can say the things that local people can't say yeah. because local people have families yeah. and therefore can be targets. Yeah. So you can kind of use your, your internationals as the person that can say the unsayable, but actually the real work is being done under the waterline sure. of the world. But the internationals have not done that. They've brought in technical anti-corruption specialists who are just swimming around in the soup. <laughs> well, you know, they're, they're actually... <laughs> the best of the interest will ring in circles around them. I, I mean, they, they wouldn't know what to do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> Don't we need a gender specialist as well? Like yeah. swimming around together, yeah. not being able to do an end of thing. All right. Oh. Yeah, okay. so, um, um, it's interesting that we've all kind of moved back to corruption itself. And I remember what you said, I think yesterday, is uh, corruption being a surrogate for, for governance. Yeah. So this is basically a governance project. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what it is. Yeah. That's basically what it is, yeah. Yeah. with corruption being perhaps the uh, framework yeah. in which you have tackled it. But I think there's a, a preliminary uh, stage that we are, well, maybe it's the onus is on us to understand it first. You know, the first image of the, of the Great Wall of China, you have the uh, <coughs> shotgun approach of the laser, the laser, uh, you really have to understand that war. Yeah. yeah. The systemically first. Yeah. Otherwise, you do what the uh, Senegalese president is doing. You, you shouldn't, if you look at that image, you, you shouldn't have the people walking on the wall. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, basically. But the, the question now becomes, how do you understand that war? I mean, some of the work we're doing has to do with corruption. I mean, there's actually, um, uh, portal, I like, urge you guys to go and look at it, anti anti graft they're all, right? The one that I project. And we've been grappling with how do you understand that war? First and foremost, before any of this can happen, okay. right? Because what happens in a, when, when it becomes systemic, right? It becomes not corruption, not becoming uh, uh, the struggle gate for governance. Corruption in Nigeria is the struggle gate for government and the state itself, and it's systemic, you know, literally wall to wall corruption. So it doesn't matter where you, you shoot. I mean, there'll be, there'll be a target, as they say in military terms, the target rich environment. Yeah. But you have to understand it. And, yeah, of course. And what is missing is this, uh, and I think you were alluding to corruption just being this large, uh, you know, really uh, disembodied, disambiguous sense. Because what you say is corruption, what exactly do you really, really, really mean? And, 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 and my own suggestion would be, I mean, part of the work is done, in my own estimation, in what we're doing, but we have to understand that war first. Mm -hmm. And there has to be some, maybe within the curriculum, an understanding of what uh, systemic corruption is really all about. And then anti, uh, 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 well, more like what corrupt practices are. And there's a UN definition of, there's a whole body of stuff there that, that I think is important. So you can recognize what it is you're dealing with. Yeah. Well, obviously, you, you, understanding of you know at least parts of the wall is critical. You know? uh, the way we got to this was uh, 
basically to, to surveys. What did people think? You know, were the areas that were most plagued by corruption? And that's what we zeroed in on. Mm. So it was procurement and taxes. So let's look at that. Mm. And once you look at that, ah, then you have to study it. Mm. You really have to study it because you can't you can't fight it unless you really know what you're fighting. Okay? So that's what that's that's how we proceed. Uh, so yeah, I guess the the moral of the story is that you know it's difficult to try and study everything the Great Wall, mm -hmm. but you know you can study parts of it, right? It, it, now, now the selection of that you know depends on you know, your own sense, right? Uh, but you know. Unless you actually do say this slice, let's understand it, you know, you won't even get the first place. Yeah, that's exactly the same on, on climate change. Yeah. Exactly mm -hmm. the same. You know, you, you go with this broad uh, theme. You get lost. In and, and you get, you get lost. lost. So yeah. People really don't Too get big. it. But if you start relating yeah. that to their life and what yeah. they are doing, yeah. then you are onto to something. That's, right. that's, that's what yeah. you need to do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. Maybe one or two more questions. I, 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 I have a DC. I, I, yeah, I, I agree that I think that I, um, if it's not in the program, more and more uh, space needs to be um, uh, focusing on that, on, on framing messages around corruption, because it's a huge challenge for all of us. If we want to do any kind of anti corruption work, uh, the, the word itself doesn't resonate with corrupt governments in most cases, and uh, it doesn't resonate with the public. So you have to find ways of translating it and, like Bruno said, make it relevant for them. Yeah. It's actually the reason why uh, your role is not paid. Yeah. Exactly. It's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, the yeah, reason yeah. why you don't have yeah. health clinic or yeah. things like that. Exactly. You have to send those messages yeah. out in, in comprehensible exactly. ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. How do you guys go to antigrams.org? Because that is basically what we're grappling with. How do you more or less establish the opportunity cost of corruption in people's lives. That is the real thrust of the argument. How do you make all these billions and billions meaningful to people and for them to understand that there is actually a cost. It's not uh, uh, a guiltless crime because it belongs to the state. You know, that whole uh, cost. Uh, but, but it's really, as we tunnel deeper deep into it, our own uh, uh, framing and methodology with some of the about four or five I will share them with one is the anatomy of corruption, huh. which deals with the body, with the, trying to put a body on corruption. So we came up with a whole list of what corrupt practices actually are by the standardized UN definition. The other bit of it is the economics of corruption. If the state itself is corrupt, there's an economic dynamic that drives corruption in the state, right? The third part is the opportunity cost of corruption, yeah. right? which is the cost to the individuals. It also measures, or attempts to measure the net outflows yeah. of, corruption, of corruption in the system. Yes. The fourth one, which is the most uh, interesting part of it, which we're you know, wrapping our minds around, is the sociology of corruption. Uh -huh. There's a reason why in Nigeria corruption is not criminalized, yeah. right? And there's some deep intellectual work that you know, we've learned some things. Yeah. You can't, you know, I've gone beyond the point of looking at it as a moral failure. Yeah, 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 but you yeah, can't, yeah. you can't look at it. Yeah. Yeah. So there are all kinds of things that have to be teased out. As I think within some kind of a general understanding of the complexity of yeah. corruption that you can now decide, okay, we're going to choose this slice of the, of the wall as the most of that slice of the wall. Or except, of course, you know, the public through polls say, well, this is where we think. And sometimes that is not what the target is. Yeah. You've got public perception. Sometimes it's not, uh, you know, it's just that. Open perception yeah. is quite different from the actual reality of where you should be training your guns. Anybody? Um, I, I think Tunji just volunteered to do a TED Talk. Yeah. The second thing is that in a couple of the other sessions, we will show. We don't actually have like the anatomy of systemic correction, so we're going yeah. to let you do that. Okay. <laughs> we do have a couple of very good examples on how people have gone about exposing this, making it transparent, and creating advocacy networks around it. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Last question, and then. <laughs> no, I've just been thinking. <laughs> The experience of our own country, that's Uganda. Uh, the president, I think, was committed to fighting corruption. But we believe that it was just you know, yeah. a statement. 
because all efforts to fight corruption kind of make a uh -huh. uh, At the moment, we have a whole movement of, led by a bishop for a time, a bishop, to fight corruption. And I think the target is punishing the civil servants who are misusing public funds. Yes. Because over, the, over time, some of those corrupt officials are moving up. Either it was just a showcase, somebody was taken to prison for one day or so, and comes yeah. back and, yeah. you know, it's showing the world that the president is doing something. But right now, what I'm seeing as a big problem is that this group is not getting the support. Whatever they do, they have a black man they know, they put them in black, so that they are they kind of, uh, they are sad, they are mourning, the loss of black men. But it seems like, they're not getting the support, so I'm trying to think how can I kind of maybe team up or support them, how they do, because I think they are targeting at least one area of corruption, which is uh, public resources. Maybe you can target a sector and can even narrow it. In education, you know, in education, you know, teachers showing up, uh, even school supplies. Things that are relatively easy, you know, a little easier to kind of get a handle on. You can start there and find the people in government, like yourself, you know, who really will work with you, you know, with, those, with that group. Yeah. Maybe the strategy is they're using because they go like move around, marching around, and then the police come to around to tear down. Well, you know, it's. it's, uh, it's uh, not easy. That's all I can say. Mm -hmm. What I take from from some of my own experience is that it does require engagement with, with people in government who want to improve things. I think unless you have that, it becomes very difficult to move things forward. But one thing, they're the ones who understand how the systems work. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. You've got to get them engaged. And I work on the belief that there are always good people in government who are willing to do that. We just need to find a way for them to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to thank Ed for a very inspiring show.